And we had a few. Well, they out. Yeah, that's right. We're going to give them away, away the money here in the first 30 seconds. They're going to be so disappointed they missed out, right? That's what happens. Here's my contact information. Um, it's also in the handout. I believe that you should have some of that information there. Um, the uh, quick start guide. It should have information at the end. Is it No, no. The, your quick start guide that's in the spiral bound, the book, should have information. But just in case you want some of it, here, here it is. Um, you have this quick start guide in your folder, right? Just wanted you to know it's also available in Spanish. If that comes in handy or if you hear of somebody that uh, would be interested, uh, we have it also in Spanish. All right. Advent Source, the Leadership Resource Center for the North American Division, has that available to you if that would be helpful at all. Reconnecting ministry is not unique or needed just in the North American division. Around the world, as I have the opportunity now to travel, um, other world divisions are struggling with the same thing. Same thing. I was in Russia a couple of, a couple of years ago and uh, had the opportunity to meet with a number of the leaders and I said, so how's it going since the openness that came now almost two decades ago? And they said it was great. The evangelists came over, and there was a lot of people who came in, and we had lots of folk who were joining the church, and, and we really liked that. I said, so how many joined? Well, they said, our best guess is about 250,000 joined in those first few years after things opened up and you remember the evangelists went over and large coliseums were rented and, and there were great, great meetings that took place. 250,000. Now you know my heart. I wanted to know, so where are they now? They said, well, about 20,000 have died, near as we can tell, in the intervening years. That happens, you know. People are born, people are dying, you know, that's the cycle of life. About 20,000. 30,000, they said, we've identified, have moved to other world divisions of the Adventist church. Their membership has gone with them. There's 50,000. They said, we can account for about 100,000. But they said, uh, we're on a path to disfellowship the other 100,000 because we've not seen them. I took a deep breath and said, Lord, help me with the right words. And I said, would you consider? It goes a long way to, to ask it that way. Would you consider that God brought these people to you for a reason? You need them as much as they need you. What if you set about to do some reconnecting ministry? You might not win them all, but you might win some. Exactly. So, some is better than none. I'm so grateful that uh, their leadership in that division took that seriously, and now they have an active reconnecting ministry in the churches, not only in Russia, but a number of the countries of the Euro-Asia division. God provides these kind of opportunities for us to speak up. And it will happen in your church. It might happen as you visit somewhere else. What I, whatever your opportunity, I would encourage you, speak up. Advocate for the inactive member. As I like to think of it, the invisible church. Because they're still part of our family. We just don't see them regularly. Well, in the North American Division, we're enjoying Elder Dan Jackson. Now he's been there in that job uh, as the president of the division. 
uh, going on four years. He was a surprise to a number of people. They didn't know who he was because he's Canadian. This is the first Canadian Adventist uh, division leader in the United States, the North American division. As a good Canadian, he loves hockey. And um, I got a picture of a puck there. He loves hockey. He says, I love to go to hockey games. He says, I was at a hockey game one time, and he said, uh, we were enjoying the game until the referee blew the whistle and made a call that we were just sure was the wrong call to make. And so he says, we all rose to our feet, and we started to lecture the referee on how he had missed that call and how it would change the game and how it was really the oddest thing that, that we had seen. He says, I think I used the word bonehead <laughs> in what I was saying. He said, I, I hate to admit that, but he tells me, I, 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 I was really kind of, and he says, the referee could care less. He said, finally, we sat down, and I kind of turned to the guy next to me, and I said, I'm not sure about the game. He says, yeah, it's going to change the, the, the outcome of the game. I, I'm sure that bad call, and they were just kind of commiserating together for a few moments. Then a lull in the conversation, as it often happens, and they're watching the action on the ice. And then the man turned to Elder Jackson and he said, do you live in this community? Yeah, I do. He said, oh, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, he said, what denomination? That's at moments like that when you're out in the public and you, you, you're asked these questions. You think for a split second, so what do I say, and what have I just done, and what do they think of me? You know how it goes? Yeah. He admits, I hesitated for just a moment, and finally he says, I, I, I figured I might as well just say it like it was. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, he said. He said, the man turned in his seat, and those seats aren't very wide if you've gone to a hockey game or any other you know, public venue. Those seats aren't very wide, but the man turned in his seat, looked him square in the eye, and he said, I grew up Adventist, and I was disfellowshipped from my church for going to hockey games. Elder <laughs> wow. wow. Jackson said, well, I'm a new pastor in this community, and he said, we go to hockey games. You'd be welcome at our church anytime. <laughs> the man is in church again. He's in church again. Folks, be ready. You never know where you'll be and what you'll be doing, and God will give you the opportunity. It will be a divine appointment, right? Believe in it. Be a, a divine appointment, and there you are. And there the other person is, and God will use those moments to help you get back together again. Ella Jackson loves to tell that story. It's been a few years since he pastored, but it's very real in his mind. And he has a reconnecting heart. It encourages us in what's done. Well, what I'd like to do is ask you a question to begin our afternoon session. Could it be? Could it be that we may have more inactively attending Adventists willing to come back to the church than we have Adventist congregations willing to receive them back unconditionally? I think that's true. God's working on minds and hearts. Count on it. And there are all kinds of Folks everywhere willing to reconnect. What will happen when they come into the doors of our church? What will happen when they go to our website? 70% or more of the people who come to your church have gone to your church website first. Or other electronic means of communicating. Some of you are looking at each other like, do, do, do we have a website? <laughs> well, yes, you do. There's, if you go to Adventist Church Connect, 
There's a website that's put, been put together for every Adventist church in the North American division. It's a basic website, gives basic contact information, and content that refreshes every other day. Then you can personalize it and make it your own with your own local pictures and contact information and so forth. That's the, the contact information is there, but other things that you want to tell about your church. But fully 70% of people go there first before they come to your church. What does your website, what is your, what, what is your Facebook page, what are these other ways that people are in touch with each other, what's it say about your church? It is worth considering. Well, from this question... We go to, so what are the nine habits of highly effective reconnecting congregations? That's the title for the afternoon. I want to work through what these habits are. The first one is, these congregations are Christ-centered. The supremacy of Jesus is lifted high in the congregation. Oh, there's an honoring of the theology of the church. There's honoring of the history of the church. There's an honoring of the practices of the church. There's an honoring of all that. But Jesus is first and foremost. That isn't true in every congregation. So, the churches are really asking the old question, which we had in bracelets around our arms and T-shirts and all kinds of places, what would Jesus do? And all kinds of variations on that. But that's the key question, isn't it? This is the church of Christ first. That's what these congregations have learned. is really important for them because it's drawing people. Especially those that have been in church for a while. Uh, then there is a preaching of hope from the pulpit that's happening in these churches. So, you might ask yourself, well, isn't that being preached in every pulpit? No. There's a lot more fear than hope being preached. There's a looking to the bad things that are happening in our world and our culture. There's a lot of reading off of the newspaper rather than from the words of scripture that bring us the hope, that lift our spirits, that give us a hope and a future. As Jeremiah would say, that's what God has for us, plans for us, for hope and a future. We sing that song, the Adventist church, don't we? We have this hope. Burns within our hearts. We need to preach about it more from our pulpits. So encourage that. Those of you who are pastors in the group, please preach that. Encourage your pastor. Preaching hope. If you want bad news, if you want fear, if you want these other messages, you can get them in lots of other places. But in our churches, those churches that are doing effective reconnecting ministry are preaching hope, the good news, the gospel from the pulpit. These churches have a culture of grace and offer second chances to people. A grace message that says, God loves you. God showed that you are so loved, God sent that favorite son. Now, I heard a sermon recently that said, oh, help me with this, Terry. God's Let's see, Jesus, God's home on earth, was that it? That whole idea that God is loving, right, and reveal that through Jesus. That grace message that, that gives us lots of hope. And not only do we want that for ourselves, but we're willing to give that to other people. Oh, I met, meet a lot of people. In fact, the data shows that uh, almost 80% of Adventists in a survey said, yeah, we believe in grace. 
But the Jews, then you start asking them other questions about would they extend that to other people, and they go, oh, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And you wonder, what kind of grace did you receive if it isn't generous to other people? You be the conduit of God's grace. You be the one to share God's grace when they can't see it or hear it or feel it. So it's not just fire insurance for you <laughs> to keep you from a hot place. It's something you want to pass along to others. That's the kind of environment that these congregations are really specializing in. It's a, a place of grace, of saying God loves you, died for you, coming back for you, wants a relationship with you that keeps you close and caring for each other. These churches are also bold on issues of inequality and injustice. Can you mute my mic? I need to cough. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. A little catch in my throat there, and I knew it. Okay. All right. Thank you. They're bold on issues of inequality because it really comes out of grace, doesn't it? When I see people who are oppressed and marginalized, I want to do something about it. Because that's the way my God is. And I want to share that with you. I want to bring the values of heaven. Once I've been touched by those values from heaven, I want to bring them here and now. And I want to do something about it that extends that grace to you. This is what these congregations are doing. When they see what is happening in our world, they, they pay attention, they do something about it, they act on it. I like the encouragement that we got this morning. When you see somebody hurting, move. Not only do we need to do that in our community's faith, and we need to do that because we want for people to say, as they did at the early Christian church, look how they love each other, right? But we, want, we don't want to do that just with our own. We wish to do that, don't we, for those who are in our community. Or in the prison. Or hanging out at the, uh, the, the Union Gospel Mission or where, whatever shelters there might be in our area. That the, uh, there are a lot of places where we can care for people. We found out in our community that we have a lot of kids who are affected by parents who are on meth. And when they make the Meth, it, it just pollutes the whole house. And so when they come in and they arrest the parents or the adults there, they've got to do something with the kids. And they're creating what they call buddy bags because the kids have to just take off all the clothes and get rid of all their stuff and then have a new set of clothes and, and new everything. We've joined others in putting these buddy bags together that just give something to them. We, we do it because it's an extension of the grace of God. We've been touched by that grace. And we want to pass that along. What's happening in your community? Find that out. That's what these churches are doing. They're very Christ-centered. I would turn you to the One Project, oneproject.org is specializing in this whole area of the supremacy of Jesus in Adventism. There are lots of great ideas there, gatherings that take place. Uh, their gathering in, uh, next February will be right here in Seattle. And I would encourage you to follow them. It's a growing network of people from churches all over the world that are saying, we want Jesus to be first and foremost in the Adventist church. We want to frame what we believe as it helps us to get to know Jesus better. We want to frame what we do as just being honoring of all that Jesus has given. This is a great group. Habit one, the Christ-centered. Habit two, they're effectively led. 
congregations. Pastor and a board and the board will agree that reconnecting ministries is a priority for them. Some of you might say, well, isn't that a given? No, it's not. I have been with groups of members, and they're all excited about it. And they go back to their church, and they say, Pastor, we just went to this, and it's a great seminar. We learned some great things, and we want to do this in our church. And the pastor will say, nah, those folk were trouble when they were here before. Let's, let's not go there. And it's so discouraging to the members. Or I'll be with a group of pastors, and they'll be very excited about this, and, and they'll go back to their membership, and the, the board and the elders and, and all will say, you know, those folk were trouble when they were here. We'd rather do an evangelistic meeting. Get new people in the front door. They don't know us so well. It's not a given that in every congregation they want to do reconnecting ministries. So come together, have a conversation. Maybe even multiple conversations. It, it may take a bit to really get buy-in. But when you do, then it's a shared vision for what can take place. And if it's not shared, then I would encourage you not to start until God brings about the right timing. Because if someone comes back and they get burned a second or third time, it's not good. It's not good. So, have lots of buy-in. Pastor and board need to agree this is a priority. These congregations are relentlessly intentional about what they're doing with their reconnecting ministry. It's that whole concept we were just talking about. They move. They make something happen. They don't sit back and go, somebody ought to do something. Be nice if that were happening around here. They say, I'm a committee of one. What can I do? I'm going to talk to you, talk to you, talk to you. Let, let's get this started. Let's kind of get this going. Not only does it help them get started, but in addition, what happens is they help keep it sustained throughout time. Because there's the ebb and flow of this ministry. Sometimes it's red hot and things are really going well, and other times you're really discouraged by what's taking place. And these churches have said, we will be intentional about this. We're in it for the long haul. It will be sustaining. Also, these congregations have a reconnecting ministry leader. We're going to talk about in the second hour what all this involves. But if you don't have a leader and a team around that leader, this ministry will flounder. Leadership is essential. So you need that team. What these churches have come to realize is their goal is to reconnect. If someone will reattend church, that's a bonus. And some of you may hear that and you may say to yourself, huh? Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to get everybody back in the pews and then we have a successful reconnecting ministry. Well, you're smart and you're nodding your head. No, we understand that point. Just reconnect. You're the church, right? You go. That's embedded in the Gospel Commission, isn't it? Go to all the world. So you're the church. You go when you're there, when you're sharing friendship with them, whether it's away from the church building or whether they honor you by coming back. You're reconnecting, and that is the goal. If they come and sit in the pew, big bonus. Extra credit. Establish a friendship. There's a, um, well, recently they just changed their name. Um, it's CYE.org, Center for Youth Evangelism. It's CYE.org slash congregation, or Church of Refuge, C-O-R stands for Church of Refuge. But the URL is CYE.org. Slash C O R. I'm sorry. It just changed, and I didn't change my slide. But 
You can write it down, right? You'll have it correct. CYE stands for Center for Youth Evangelism. Now, some might be hearing that and say, well, that's for youth ministry, right? I'm slow. CYE dot O-R-G slash C-O-R. And if you can tell me what that stands for, that's extra credit. All right? Some of you might be looking at that and say, well, that's for youth ministry. Well, guess what we're finding? If it works well for youth ministry, it helps for the rest of us geezers. All right? There's some good things that they have in that ministry that really helps not only engage the younger generation, but helps the rest of us to feel like, all right, we have intentional leadership. We're effectively led by what we do. I would, inter I would turn you to that website. What I'm trying to do is give you resources that you can turn to, all right, because our time is limited this afternoon. The third area is this. These churches um, have effective greeting going on. We're noticing that maybe one of the most important reconnecting ministries that takes place in the local church is right there at the front door or in the parking lot. <laughs> it is the first step. First impressions do matter, friends. In fact, the research says within the first 30 to 60 seconds that someone walks into the door, they have the finger to the wind, they know which way the wind's blowing, and they will come to a determination of how warm and friendly that church is, and every other experience they will have on Sabbath morning will either confirm or deny their initial assessment. And some of you say that's completely unfair. They have not been to our engaging, intellectually stimulating Sabbath school. How do they know what our church is like? And then they've not been to our engaging worship experience. How do they know what our church is like? And then they've not been to our potluck meal. It's very unfair. Unfair or not, perception is reality. And these folk have their antenna up. They are coming back. They're very uneasy doing so. And they're just looking for how this is going to go. 30 to 60 seconds. So you can see now the importance of, of the greeting ministry, right? But I'm afraid too many of our nominating committees have gotten greeters involved just because they couldn't say no. And people show up 30 to, uh, maybe 30 minutes early, but more, more likely five minutes early before the program, and they're quickly handing out bulletins, and then, and then when that's done, they think they're done. These churches doing effective reconnecting ministry have said, we're going to be training our greeters for the success of the greeting that will happen. I can tell you lots of horror stories on greeting. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you one. He hadn't been to church in years. He called his mother early May and he said, Mom, I want to go to church with you. That's my Mother's Day gift to you. She was elated. She went and bought a new outfit, purse and shoes, ladies, everything was there. <laughs> All right? She went and got the car clean, detailed. She was excited. She came to the church, met her son in the parking lot. They walked together toward the front doors of the church. She couldn't be more happy. She opened the doors of the church. They both took one step inside. From across the lobby could be heard these words from the longtime greeter. Well, 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 our little black sheep is home. Now, friends, I don't think that woman woke up, woke up that Sabbath morning and said, I'm going to try to offend about three people before this Sabbath day is over. Do you? No. I don't think so. I just think that people get caught in situations they've never thought through before. They don't understand some of the values that we want to really convey in what we do in ministry in the church. And when they get in that moment, they blurt out something, and then their pride takes over, and they can't apologize, and hurt happens, and it's all over. And that first 30 to 60 seconds is really the barometer by which everything else follows. Hmm. 
So he just about left. The mother's heart died. He's back at church now, but it took lots of years to win him back. Greeting ministry is important, friends. And we've got to get training. I, I have a seminar on greeting. I'd love to get into some of it. But the basic premise of greeting is you're giving the greeting the other person wants to receive, not the one you want to give. Which means you've got to read people well. Remember their names. A lot of us groan, oh boy. I watched two greeters one time handle this really well. Oh, I'm, I'm creeping into my seminar on the greeting, aren't I? Two guys. Bob, Bill. Bob loved to give people a greeting, would stand by the door and give them a wonderful greeting. He sensed what was an appropriate greeting, but some days Bob couldn't even remember his own name. You spell it either way, it spells the same way, right? B O B. Right? Bob was gregarious and just welcomed people well. Bill was very quiet. But he knew every name of everybody in the church. He had gone through the church directory, memorized the names, but he wouldn't have given a good greeting. But the two of them teamed up. And Bill would say quietly to Bob, this is Betty coming the door. And Bob would say, Betty! <laughs> We're glad you're here today. And Betty would beam because Bob remembered her name. Right? Yeah. Well, Bill remembered the name. And they worked as a team. Why do we think we have to be self-contained and have it all together? Why don't we team up together and help each other? Greeting ministry, my friends, happens. And the training sessions are not only to say, here's what we value and here's what we want to do. Here's what we want you to look like and smell like. Huh? Okay? Yeah? We don't want you standing in a holy huddle holding all the bulletins in your hand. We really want you to share them. We want you to take people where they need to go. You get the idea. Exactly. And what we do in this training now is we role play for the successful experience that we will have next Sabbath and every Sabbath this year. You got to role play. And sometimes you role play what you want to achieve and sometimes you role play what you've seen happen and you start to laugh about it and you go, oh, okay, we're not going to do that again. But there's got to be far more greeter training. That's what these churches are learning. And those churches are places where every member's a greeter. Oh, no, you don't nominate everybody from the nominating committee to be a greeter. But there is just that mindset of, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to help you. This is going to be a good day for you. It's that kind of environment that people are coming back to in our churches. Well, I would encourage you to go to adventsource.org, I'm sorry. Go to webinars, greeters. This is a presentation. You'll recognize the presenter. It's a free resource. All right? And also I've heard um, of evangelismcoach.org has some good greeter information. This is in the wider Christian community. There's more that needs to be put together. Several of you encouraged me earlier, I need to write some books, don't I? Keep encouraging me. I'll do it. She does? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Need to do more. Sure. I enjoyed meeting him that day. I was in a church, and yes, sir. I don't know, but in this day and age, maybe your office could produce some uh, videos. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Well
So you mean I ought to get out of the Gutenberg age and get into the Google age? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> You're right. Yes. Readers, yeah. Readers, but yeah. Thing they want to see it. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Honey, would you write that down? <laughs> I have to take a vacation, don't I, to be able to, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Good recommendation. You're right. The more visual, the better. Yep, that's the way we are. And we stream it online, and we have a DVD, and we have other ways, right? Yes, that's right. We could share, couldn't we? Because we're all in this together, after all. Yeah. So there he was. I enjoyed meeting him. He said, um, I would come to church with my wife. And when church was done, I went to the car while she was visiting with people. And I get, uh, get a bag that I had prepared, and I would bring it into the church. I would go to the men's restroom. I would change out of my church clothes into my work clothes. And on the way home from church, she would drop me off at work. I did this for years, he said. I didn't hide it. I didn't make a big deal of it either. He says, I was in the car one day. Driving along, he says, I don't remember what the, the, the Baptist pastor was talking about, but he was a radio pastor, and he was, he was t preaching there on the radio. Uh, I was listening to it, and he said, I was convicted in that moment. I don't remember what the topic was at all, but I was convicted in that moment that God would take care of our family finances if I stopped working on Sabbath. I thought that was interesting, wasn't it? Exactly right. God would take care of the finances of our family if I stopped working on Sabbath, and I realized that's why I was doing it. But this was a Baptist pastor talking on some other topic. It wasn't even related to this at all, but guess what? The Spirit of God is active. Speaking to minds and hearts. Well, that's what happened. Went to his boss, and he said, I know I've been working Saturdays for lots of years, he said, but uh, I need to be done with that. I don't know what it will mean to my, my job here or whatever, but I just need that decision. The boss took it well, and it changed this man's life. He said to me, if the church people, this man had said, if the church people had been twisting on my arm, I don't think I would have changed. But in God's timing, in God's way, I changed for the right motivations. He said, I'm the head elder of the church now. And he said, nobody had criticized me along the way, just encouraged me all the more to live the life that God was leading me to. Friends, people are coming back. They're re-engaging in our churches. Let's look for those opportunities to encourage them along the journey. Well, these churches in Habit 4 are paying attention. You remember the dropout track we talked about this morning. They're paying attention to that. They're seeing the signs along the way, and they're responding to them. They're not just kind of letting them go, going, oh, wow. Well, we ought to do something about that. That ought, to, <laughs> that ought to be dealt with later. They're doing as Gail was encouraging us this morning. Let's move. Let's respond. They're paying attention to this. They're remembering it, and they're noticing the signs early and responding to them. 
You know, we count what we value. I don't know uh, about you, but uh, men in your pocket, women in your purse, my guess is you know pretty close to how much money you're carrying today, right? Oh, then if a couple of dollars, you, you know about where you, what you have because we count what we value. Are we counting who's there and who isn't there, church? Now, some of you may remember the era when we counted who was there, and if you had perfect attendance, you got a gold star in the children's division, but you got the equivalent of a gold star among the adults, right? All kinds of accolades if you had perfect attendance. I'm not talking about that. That was a whole perfectionist trip, I think, that I'm glad we're away from. What I'm talking about here is just a reminder to us that we would forget if we didn't have some way of counting. So who's here and who isn't there? Because there's clear evidence that responding quickly helps tremendously. But if we're not documenting it, then it might be easy to think, well, were they here last week? Well, I think so. Two weeks ago? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we don't remember, right? Unless we document it in some way. I was going to say put it on paper. My brother back here would say some electronic device, right? <laughs> have some electronic way, have some way to, to get the information documented so that we know. This is for our purpose, because we count what we value. So find a way. Now, if you get a group this size, you can probably count who's there and who isn't there. But if you double this size group, then you start to wonder, let's see, did I get that person? No, I, I think I did. No. Well, they moved. Now, you know, and you, and you start to doubt if you really have accurate records. So what these larger and larger groups are doing is that they assign pew pastors. Pew pastors. Meaning, you'll pay attention to this row and that row, and that's all you have to pay attention to because somebody else is paying attention to that row and this row. Right? And then somebody else has these rows. And you can pay attention to, to these rows, just two or three. You don't have to be responsible for the entire sanctuary. And what you'll do is you'll just say, so-and-so, they're here, they're here, they're here. Oh, so-and-so's missing. I haven't seen them for a few weeks. I heard they were on a, cure, on a cruise. And so you contact them and say, how's that cruise? They say, it was great. Let me show you some pictures. Well, then you're good to go. But if somebody else has been away for a while, then you can intervene more quickly if you're paying attention. You're a pew pastor. You're caring for the people who are there. Some of you might wonder, so how does that work? Well, it works because we're creatures of habit. Right? When you go to church, you probably park in a very similar place every week, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And you walk in the same door, don't you, at church? Yep. See the same greeter. If you, there's a, a consistent greeter there. Right? And you walk the same hallways, walk into the sanctuary, you sit about the same place every week. And I hope you're not one of those people that somebody's sitting in your seat, you say, you're in my pew. <laughs> Wasn't that long ago, a couple got up the courage to come back to church. Mother, father, several kids. They sat down in the row. They were there enjoying the, the, the first th few things that were happening in the program until the phone rang. Exactly right. In the man's pocket, he had it on vibrate, right? His phone vibrated in his pocket. He's one of those types that couldn't resist it. So he, hello? On uh, the other end of the phone, can you hear it coming? On uh, the other end of the phone, someone said, I asked the greeter, who gave me your information that you put into the welcome book. And that's how I got your number. I just wanted to let you know you're sitting in our row. Oh, no. Would you please move? Oh, 
friends, if that happens in your church, I would hope you would intervene and say, we don't do that here. Yeah. We don't do that here. We'll start charging them for their pew. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, some people believe they paid for it. <laughs> and they own it. Yeah. In the church, I put this in the evidence review in an article here recently, I believe every seat is open to every person. The only exception is someone with a disability, right? We ought to have honored places for them. But every seat is open in the house of God. Well, we count what we value, but, you know, if you're sitting in those pews, that's, that's how we make this work. Pew pastors just know who's here and who isn't here. That's sometimes the benefit, going back to greeters, of having the same people be at the same doors because you'll recognize who comes in those doors and then you'll start to notice who's not. Capitalize on human behavior. Use it for your advantage in ministry. Well, advocacy. Got to pay attention. Advocacy is so important in our churches. There are a lot of folk, a lot of folk, that we need to advocate for. I've heard of way too many board meetings where a name's been brought up, details about stories have been told about that person, it's been identified what their motivation was for doing what they were doing, and actions have been taken without one conversation with that person. Friends, that's wrong. I'm just going to say it straight out. It's wrong. Matthew 18 is clear. You go to the person first. And you follow that progression. We've got to stop that sort of thing. You've got to advocate in your church and say, time out. Who's talked to that person? Nobody around the circle? And if it's hearsay, then say, I think we ought to go directly, and we've got to verify some of this information. And once we've had that one-on-one -on -one conversation, then we'll pick up our conversation. Follow Matthew 18 and to do that kind of progression. But we've got to be, have much more advocacy. I was a group of men one day, and we were standing around visiting. When one of the men said, hey, did you see? In our union paper, they had a, an article. They interviewed a man who was helping some young people do a mission trip. And he said, I know that man has no interest in the church, he said. He said some awful things about the, about the Adventist church. I don't think that... Uh, we should have wasted the column inches in our union paper to interview him. My eyes were kind of big. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. Other men joined in. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he's a disgrace. And they were just running this guy down so fast I couldn't believe it. So I used one of my favorite phrases again. Would you consider? <laughs> I said, would you men, men consider that his willingness to be interviewed for the union paper may indicate his first timid steps toward coming back to the church. Advocacy. Speak up for those who aren't there, especially when they're not in the room. Say, I think they're more spiritual than we're giving them credit. Speak up for our inactive members. We're pretty hard on each other. Advocacy is important. When you go to creativeministry.org, look under resources, look for the uh, tab on research. There is some data here on how to notice folk and what to do with that dropout track. Further description than I even gave it this morning. There's a ready resource to help. So we're paying attention. I'm pressing through here. You doing all right? Okay, a few more minutes, we'll take a break. Habit five. These churches have a specialized group. If someone gets up the courage to come in the door, come to your church, what kind of environment do you have for them that would be a safe place, a city of, your, a city of refuge? You know that Old Testament model, right? That if you happened to kill someone, uh, the family could come after you, no questions asked, they'd take your life, everything would be settled. I don't know how that's settling it, but vengeance isn't always satisfactory. But 
We need cities of refuge, places where people can run and they at least have a hearing. That was the goal of a city of refuge in Old Testament times. In these groups, they have consistent leadership, leadership that is there. They're, they're called the regulars, you know, the people you can count on, who set that tone, who have that ability to just let whatever your life's experience be told, and they're not going to panic about it. Consistent leadership. Uh, these people are willing to set aside the agenda, the conversation, the topic of the day to hear people's story and hear them from the heart. She came to church spiritually single. Oh, she was married, had two children, but he didn't come to church on a regular basis. She was spiritually single. She came to church. So it surprised us that Sabbath when he showed up. Came to one of these kinds of groups, felt like it was a safe place enough that we were in the middle of a conversation, and he raised his hand and he said, what we're talking about here reminds me of my boarding school academy experience. He said it was back in the 70s. He says all of us guys had the long hair, and he started to do this. At this point, he's bald, right? But back then, he's kind of nursing the old memory. He says, well, we had the feathered back hair. He's doing this, you know. And we'd comb it. We had the big comb on our part. You remember the days, right? <laughs> and he said, yeah, right, Charlie, yeah. Sir, sure. so we comb our hair. And he says, the principal would say, boys, when you go home for home leave, you've got to get your hair cut. He says, Psh, we weren't going to get our hair cut. That wasn't the way you did things in the 70s. He said, I long hair. He said, I was in my dorm room one night. Roommate and I were studying, visiting, when the lights went out in the rooms. You remember how this went? Lights went off in the rooms, but there was still a light on the hallway of the dormitory. So I said, roommate and I visited for a little bit, and we both fell asleep. Middle of the night, he said, a shaft of light came in the room because the dean opened up the door. The resident assistants were right behind him. They rushed into our room, he said. He said, they grabbed me out of bed. The RAs pinned me to the floor. The dean cut off my long hair with the scissors. This guy's face was red. His jaw was clenched. And you could tell. And he said, I vowed when I grabbed that diploma from that principal, I was out of here and I was out of the church. We set aside what we had planned for the rest of that Sabbath school, and we just kind of processed what he had just told us. He didn't come back for about a month, six weeks, but when he came back, we're in the middle of a conversation, another conversation of that Sabbath, when he raised his hand. He said, what we're talking about here reminds me of my academy experience, he said. You start to laugh. He told this whole story, top to bottom. Friends, what's happening? It's his point of pain, isn't it? He's not getting past it. And as we started to evaluate this, some of the leaders of the group, we started to realize he wasn't past this, not only with the church, but it was affecting his health, his career, his family, all of the areas of his life. He was stuck. He couldn't get over it. But that's the goal of this group, is to hear people and hear them from the heart. If they had he had gone to some other Sabbath school class, what would have happened had he launched into the story again? People would have said, we heard your story before. We're trying to get to Tuesday's lesson. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Shut him down. He came back and told that story top to bottom four times. <clears throat> then there came the Sabbath when he started to launch into it. And he said, I told you guys this story. And then he said, because you've listened, I'm over it now. I'm over it now. That's the goal of a city of refuge, where you can work through your stuff, and people have stuff, and they want to come to a safe spiritual place to help process it. And that's what happened for him. It's got to be perceived as a ministry of the church I've had to get some out of hot water because it was perceived it was the beginning of a breakaway group from the church. If you have this group started, you've got to stay close to the elder board and the pastors of your church. 
Just keep talking. Keep telling them what's happening. Ask if they have any questions. Say, this is part of the reconnecting ministry of this church, right? It's a priority here, right? And you keep getting that agreement. But you have to have a specialized group. Because now your greeters, when, when they can tell you haven't been to church in a while, or, or you say so, they say, I think you'd like a group. Let me, let me show you. And they take you to this kind of safe place. Now count on the fact there's going to be a large percentage of people who like to come to that group and don't come to anything else you have going on for a while. And that's okay. Because it's a process. It's a journey home, isn't it? So let that be enough. They'll come to sit in the pew in the sanctuary one day in God's timing, in God's way. There is a resource being used by a number of these groups. It's called Sharing Scripture. It's available at AdventistBookCenter.com. It takes the same theme, the Bible texts, as the adult quarterly, but it puts in lots of questions that really gets people thinking about, so what happened in my week? How does it relate to this topic? What am I going to do going forward? And creates that sense of safety. Sharing Scripture. It's available at AdventistBookCenter.com. Habit six, these congregations are listening well. We're given two ears and one mouth for a reason. And yet when our inactive members start saying, oh, I have some questions, I'm not sure, and so forth, they come to the place where they realize they're going to push me. And it's counterintuitive when we listen. We're going to change the tape. So give us a pause for just a moment. We'll pick it up right after that. When they say, I don't believe in the... <laughs> right, right. I was just generalizing, Charlie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're... We... Uh... That's right. That's right. We're... Let's, let's gather around and pray for him, right? <laughs> no, but it's true. When somebody says, everybody's a hypocrite there, we want to defend, right? They say, I don't believe in the message anymore. We want, to, we want to help establish again why it's important. And we get talking, 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 and pretty soon they go, yeah, well, whatever. What the inactive member tells me is, I want you to hear me. Just listen. You don't have to agree. You don't have to disagree. It really doesn't, what I just need is to tell someone, to process it out loud, to know that somebody would really want to hear me and hear me from the heart. And we're getting too defensive. And when we get angry back, defensive back, they easily then can write it off and count on the fact that inactive members will try to test us. They will. They'll ask questions and they really kind of want to, get you in a debate. Because they, then is intellectual, and really this is a heart issue that you're trying to work on, a relational issue. You know, in listening, it's an unselfish gift that we give. And you know why that's true. You've probably heard the theories, haven't you? Your mind can process Everything I'm saying to you this afternoon, if I picked up my pace and talked a little faster, you'd understand every bit of what I'm saying and, and process all of it. You're, you're watching how I'm presenting that, and you pick it all up. And at the very same time, you're thinking to yourself, these, char these chairs are getting hard to sit on. All right? And I wonder what they're going to have for supper tonight. <laughs> and I wonder where we're going to go on vacation come this summer and 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 your mind's processing every bit of that and you're listening to what I'm telling you and your mind is capable of far more and yet when you're listening to somebody the unselfish give you gift you give is you push away some of those other things you could be thinking about to really hear them and hear them from the heart remember Communication is 7% words that are spoken. It's 93% everything else.
para language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Leaning in, right? It's how I'm dressed, how I smell. All of those things factor into communication. That's 93%. It's only 7% words. If I said to you, that, so tell me about your vacation. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> really, did you enjoy it? Did you, did you like what you did? Would you do it again? I said all right, the right words, right? Uh-huh. But what did I communicate? I really don't care. Exactly. Don't get it started. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That's right. That's another seminar, another day. That's right. <laughs> we've, got, we've got to really hear each other. And, and once again, like readers, we need to educate more on how to listen. We have presentations we make and we talk, 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 talk. Are we really helping people learn skills to listen? It is one of the fundamental, elemental building steps of a reconnecting ministry, listening and listening well. So we need to teach in the classes. We've got to be a non-anxious presence. It means we're just willing to lean back. The, the counselors, of course, among us understand that. The chaplains understand that being a non-anxious presence, that's a lot non-verbal. It's like, you could tell me whatever you want. I'll hear it. Help you process it. I'm not saying I buy it. But that doesn't matter. How can I be a non-anxious presence with you? That's what's happening in these congregations. Advent Source has a resource called Learning to Care. It's a lot about listening. It takes someone who's accredited to give the presentation. But you would benefit, I think, in your church in getting some regular listening classes, seminars going in your church. So you create an environment where people are really well educated in the area of listening. She grew up Adventist, but got caught in the web of addiction. Her addiction was alcohol. She got drunk one night on the town. The taxi driver brought her home, led her into the house. She collapsed on the floor in the living room. Her head up against the little table, the, the, the stand that was right there next to the sofa. She said, when I came to in the middle of the night, I somehow left a little light on. And she said, I couldn't move, but she said, right there in front of me were some books. One of them was entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son. She told me I was sure that wasn't my book. But there it was. And she told me the story. She said, I really couldn't move from that floor, but I, there was enough light. I started to read the pages of that book. Convicted my heart that I needed to return home to my spiritual home. She said, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to go to a Bible study or a church, but she says, I knew I needed prayer. And I figured, well, I think that Adventist churches still do prayer meeting. That's true in most churches, but not all. And she said, I, I uh, went to the local church on Wednesday night, and sure enough, they had a prayer meeting going. She says, I purposefully arrived late and sat in the back row. I didn't want to be seen. And she said, they allowed that. She said, some churches tell you, come up, come up, come up, come into the, you know, and they want you to be all gathered around, and they say, you're late, you know, and they do all these kind of things that really shame people. And she said, I didn't need that, but they didn't do that. They just let me sit in the back row. There were some beautiful thoughts that were shared, she said, and then it came time to pray. And when it came time to pray, there was a woman who got up from, up toward up front, and she came back to where I was and sat down next to me. And we prayed together. 
When we were done praying, I felt such a peace, she said, come over my, my spirit. That She said, I knew I had come to the right place at the right time. Turns out this was the pastor's wife who had done this. She said, I felt safe enough with her that I went home and she said, I got out a legal pad and I started writing longhand my story. Page after page after page. She says, 24 pages later. She says, I wrapped that up, put it in an envelope. I found the address of the pastor's home. She says, I went to the home. I leaned up that envelope against the garage door so that when they came home and the door went up, they'd see that there was a letter there for them. She said, they must have read the letter because at 7 o'clock the next morning, the pastor's wife called me. She says, I read your story with interest. She said, I enjoyed praying with you. Pastor's wife said, I sense that you would like prayer. Here's something I want to offer, she said. I will call you every morning for the next year. You won't be long. doesn't need to be long. I'll just see if there's anything I can pray for with you, and we'll have prayer to start our day. What do you think? And this gal said, that's just what I need. For 365 days, pastor's wife was consistently calling. What can I pray for today? And they'd pray. She said, pretty soon I started praying for the pastor's wife. <laughs> and together we would pray together. She's actively involved in church. God took away the addiction. 40 years, 365 days, it's God's timing. People are reconnecting, friends. And it's happening because we commit ourselves to helping make that difference. Well, habit seven is this. These churches are including people quickly. If exclusion is one of the key reasons why they left, a relational rift Felt them, they felt excluded, then inclusion is a wonderful solution. The literature is saying you've got to include people within six weeks after the, they honor you by coming back. Six weeks? Just think about it. Six weeks from now is the, the end of May, right? Whoa, that's a short turnaround. And then introduce them to six other people. Well, if that's the data that's showing up, it means we've got to pay attention and we've got to move. Like we, we have a theme going on here, don't we? You can't just kind of sit back and go, well, I'll get to it. That day will never come. Introduce them to six people. Why do you do that? Because you want them to feel included. And I've got to tell you something. I want to clue you in. Uh, I don't know. Somebody had to break it to you at some point. You, you don't appeal to everybody. <laughs> You're surprised, I know. You don't appeal to everybody. Yeah. You know that, right? I mean, some personalities click and others don't. You may be in similar life stage. You might have something that, that would really work, your profession is similar, you have some kids, they have some kids, you know, you have some grandkids, you, you, you have a way to relate to some people, but other people, it just doesn't work. So, that's why you introduce them to other people, and then your opportunity is to not become offended if they're not as close a friend of yours, but they become a close friend of somebody else's. Just praise God they have somebody with whom they're friends. That becomes the blessing. So I introduce them, six weeks, introduce them, include them rather, in six weeks, introduce them to six people. Use Jesus' method to include people. You know, Jesus said, right, go out two by two, exactly right. So why not start including people with you when you do something in ministry in the church? 
You're headed out to do a Bible study. Take somebody with you. You're ready to go set up chairs at the church. Take somebody with you. You're going to visit somebody in the hospital and you're taking some flowers. Take somebody with you. You're going to do the flower arranging, arranging your, yourself. Get somebody to do this with you. Some of you look at me like, Paul, that's the slowest way to do anything. <laughs> I fully acknowledge that. But is it the best way to do ministry? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and you multiply the effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So include, include, include. But please avoid desperation. Man got up the courage to come back to church, enjoyed the worship experience, had a great time there, was going out in the lobby, and he hadn't visited with anybody until a man came up to him and greeted him, and they, they did some small talk and built some rapport for a few moments. And then the man said, I had two questions for you. He said, he said do you have a computer at home? And the, the man visiting said, yeah, I do. He said, well, have you ever worked with QuickBooks or Quicken or any of those software packages that... That, that, that help with some bookkeeping and accounting. And he says, well, I've dabbled in it just a bit. He says, well, that's good. Our church treasurer was transferred out last week. You're our new church treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> that's desperation, folks. Avoid it. Because the inactive member who came and had loved the experience to that moment said, it was as if the air just got sucked out of the room. And I was, I need breath. I need to get outside. And he got out to his car, and he said, I put the pedal to the metal, and I got out of there. Because it was desperate. The group was desperate. Let God take care of that. Get some other people involved who have been there for a while. There's a resource called Connections, Implementing Spiritual Gifts. It's available at adventsource.org. I would encourage you to do that because it helps you to, to find where people are gifted and get them involved in that way. Include people quickly. Habit eight. These churches are planning activities because church buildings have bad memories attached to them. If we think we're only going to connect when they show up at the church building, that may not happen readily. I had one woman say, I can't go back to that church building. That's where Grandma's funeral was. And all I can remember when I go into that sanctuary is right up at the front, there's Grandma's casket, and we're all walking by and we're heartbroken. I can't go back to that building. Or he says to me, I came from the back room. The pastor and I were standing up here. Here she came down the aisle. She said to me, vowing, I'll be with you in sickness and health till death do us part. And then she left with him. You're telling me I have to come to that church sanctuary for us to be reconnected? I can't do it. So these churches that are doing re effective reconnecting ministry are, are doing that ministry away from the church. They're building bridges away from the church and its active reconnecting ministry away from the building. They're providing a wide range of activities. In fact, the more, the better. The more creative, the better. The more active, the better. And when they do that, they're building rapport and creating a connection there. Because you remember the goal is a reconnection. If they sit in the pew, that's a bonus. So there's a variety of things take place. I mean, the safe things are a book club, right? Some art and craft and whatever you might try. And then other people are doing real creative things. But every time, you're making sure you pay attention to, so who's here? And how can we build bridges with folks? Advent Source, once again, has a resource called the Quick Start Guide. And you have it in your book. All right? That will give you more ideas. And you can see in that book, there are lots of things that are suggested in that booklet, in the Quick Start Guide. It's this that we're talking about in English and Spanish, right? Okay.
All right? So, habit eight, habit nine, sorry. These congregations doing effective reconnecting ministry are actually visiting with inactive members. Some of you may say, what? What? That seems obvious. That, that's intuitive, isn't it? No, not always. I hear churches saying, now that's the best thing that ought to be done. Somebody ought to be doing it. I hope somebody gets around to, to making that happen. And they need to be a committee of one that say, and I'll do something about that. What happens in these churches is that they've got to walk their talk. They've got to organize their visits. You've got to use the popular social networking sites to create connections. You've got to take the long-term approach, friends. Because when you take that long-term approach, it means that you realize you're running a marathon, not a 50-yard dash. You've got to support those who are visiting the inactive members. Because you'll burn out if you're doing this alone. If you're handling it by yourself, it'll become overwhelming to you. So you've got to gather support. People who will say, how's it going? Now remember you have a confessional relationship with that inactive member that you're visiting with. Don't go, don't go telling the details that you're hearing. But if they're expressing angry words and, and there are lots of misgivings about their experience with the church, you've got to... You've got to share that somewhere. And what you're sharing is how you feel when you hear all that. I've had some people who say, I got out and did some stuff. I went and visited some people. But after a while, I started believing what they were saying. And, and I almost got to the place where I said, I'm going to leave too. <laughs> if you don't have that kind of support. Right? So come around these people and say, how can we lift you up? You're doing important ministry. I don't know that I could do it, but I'm here to support you and what you're doing. I know you're copying this down. There's a lot that we can add to this. I'll have just a few things in just a moment. But actually visiting. There are some hints in this quick start guide for what to do. Ten things you can do that you can uh, incorporate into your visitation ministry. I just want to tell you right here and now, there's no magic formula. There's no, I, if I do these three things, it will always work out well. It has to be tailor-made to the individual. And count on the fact that you'll flub some stuff up. Be okay with that. And be humble enough to apologize to the person and say, would you give me another chance? I'd like to do that differently next time. And you have some people who seem to be very responsive and other people who you can't get through to. Refer to others who maybe will build some rapport more readily than you have. And some, it's not God's timing. Let that be okay. The youth ministry, young adult youth ministry of the North American Division has put together a resource called Mission Lifeguard. Concept is, it's great to be in the water. We want to be in the water. But you can't be of the water. <laughs> right? Or you'll have drowned. When you're going down, we need people who are spotters, people who pay attention to those who are going down in the water. And we have people, right, in the perfect storms of anxiety-provoking events that are going down. They're just saying, help. This is a wonderful resource that helps with actually visiting with our inactive members. Youth, young adult, middle-aged adult, it really helps all. So this gives you an idea of the nine habits of highly effective reconnecting congregations. What I want to do now is uh, change my slides. I want to suggest to you how to embed the reconnecting ministry in your church. You still with me? I know the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure, so... <laughs> let's just press for a few more minutes and give you 
uh, uh, just a quick overview of some ways I think that will help you embed this kind of ministry in the local church. Um, my friends had the opportunity to, to go to a church, and when they walked in the door, a longtime greeter came up to them and said, we don't have our bulletins right here, so she said, I just want to warn you. We have a guest speaker today, she said. Oh, no. Now, they're usually not very good. Oh. But it's all we have, she said. We're between pastors. My friends were there that day because they had been asked by the conference president to come and speak at the church. <laughs> they didn't let on why they were there, and they just went and sat down. Pretty soon, the, uh, there was another couple came up and gave them a nice invitation. We, we have a fellowship lunch at our house, they said. We don't have the room here in the church to have the lunch here, so we'll caravan from here and go to our home. That was the kind of invitation they hoped to receive. About then, this longtime greeter came back, bulletins in hands now, <laughs> handed to the friends, and she said, by the way, did that couple over there invite you to lunch? Yeah, they said, wondering what shoe will drop next. <laughs> and uh, they said, yes, she did. Well, that's good. She put her hands on her hips. She says, I have to check up on everybody in this church to make sure they're doing what they say they will. Got to love the saints, right? <laughs> or something. But maybe you've met a greeter like this. The ain'ts, yeah. What it takes, friends, is to change the culture in a congregation. And let me share with you some of the things that we've noticed in the congregations that uh, successfully do a reconnecting ministry. Number one, they name the reconnecting initiative. They give it a name. Words do shape our reality. They articulate a vision for the future. They state why we can't stay here. Because when you come, come to naming the initiative and talking about the values of the initiative, count on the fact that somebody's going to hear what you say the preferred future is, and then what they'll do is they'll raise their hand and say, that's all well and good, but is it that bad around here? Isn't it okay the way it is? And words to that effect. Be ready for that moment. Be ready with examples like greeter stories gone bad. <laughs> like fist fights in the board. Right? Start putting together your response because when you articulate a preferred future, a new place that you want to go, count on the fact that some people want to stay in Egypt rather than go to the promised land. And be ready to say, well, I don't think we want to stay in Egypt for these reasons. They want us to make bricks and they don't give us straw. They beat us every day. You know, Moses had to say those sorts of things, right? To the people of Israel. They don't feed us, well, they take away our firstborns. They, eh, we can't stay here any longer. We need to move. Be ready with that. You got a name. Not only give it a name, but you've got to describe to people why you want to move forward. And some things that people have, have, have named this. The North American Division has a reach initiative. Reach up, reach out, reach across, reach down. And in the area of reach across is this initiative for, for reconnecting. Isn't that symbolic? I want to reach to you, reach across, or maybe each one find one. When we do evangelism and outreach, you know, it's each one reach one, right? But what if we find somebody that we haven't seen in church in a while, or welcome home, or how about remember me, remember me? Just a few ideas. Please, be creative with what you do. But that's the sort of thing that helps kind of Get some momentum going in their ministry. Two, to change the culture, you need to pray without ceasing for reconnecting ministries. 
pray without ceasing. Our general conference president several years ago uh, asked that we, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day, we have prayer in our homes. He still encourages that. Why not at times like that, we pray and have a list like we've been developing all day today, right? Names of people, they still are coming to your mind and heart, aren't they? Just pray over those names. You know the emphasis here this weekend. Prayer changes things. If we do nothing but pray in this initiative, we've done a good things. Pray in every home, at every church meeting, with your prayer ministry teams that have a special prayer focus in the church. Make this a decided emphasis. As well as talking about, remember the missionaries and call porters across the sea? I mean, we, we'd still do that, don't we, in some of our prayers? Or who's in the hospital? Or who lost a job? At the same time, let's say, let's, re let's just pray for the empty chairs in the room. They represent people who used to be here. I mean, there are a lot of churches that, that, that like that kind of imagery. Empty pews. Empty spaces in the parking lot. Make it real and tangible and creative. It helps people. Pray without ceasing. Develop a Reconnecting Ministries team early on. I mentioned we'd get to this. You want someone who's very passionate about this ministry, who maybe was away and now has come back and who has great enthusiasm for reconnecting, has some great ideas, is willing to help lead, is appointed or nominated in your church. It's not in the church manual yet to say, that you need to have someone. We're working on that. It takes a number of years to get that through the process. But before then, whatever your church decisions are, just come to that place where you say, that's our recognized leader. Now, remember, we don't appeal to everybody. And what goes with that is we're not superhuman and we can't do everything. We need other people around us. After all, this is the body of Christ, right? So, here are a few ideas. How about an elder? Someone with some wisdom, understands kind of how to get decisions processed through the leadership of the church. Get one of your elders involved in this. In fact, we'd encourage it from the North American Division. Reconnecting is part of ministerial. And ministerial is giving some real attention to elders. We maybe have as many as 20,000 elders across the North American Division. Elders would be well positioned to help us with this. How about somebody who was once inactive or is now inactive but is willing to give you some feedback? I think that there are plenty of committees that get all revved up about a great idea and they're just sure it's going to be really good and then they start testing it with some folk and, and if you get some inactive members that go, uh-uh. It won't fly with me, and it won't fly with my friends. That's a good reality check. They're a friend to you if they help you to know what's real. But if they go, well, that's not bad. That's all right. Well, now you have a winner, right? So you go with that. A natural promoter. We talked about that earlier today. Get a promoter involved. Who's going to get the posters up? Who's going to get the tweets going out, my brother would say. Electronic stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> who, would, who would get all of the, all of the things going to, to really let everybody know what's happening? It really raises the profile initiative. Somebody who's detail-oriented. Because you can count on the fact that someone who's very passionate about the ministry will li leave some of the details undone. And posters that are spelled correctly and handouts that are well-presented and photocopied and don't have big streaks across them. We need those kind of people. And if you have a gift table, you want to have good gifts that are there. Somebody with detail orientation. Have a team. That makes for good reconnecting ministry. Brandon got on his motorcycle, and he was enjoying his ride down the streets of Logan, Utah here a couple of years ago. Remember this story? 
Logan, Utah, he was on his way. He was having a good time. And he started to go into an intersection, and all of a sudden, wham! His car got hit by this vehicle. Here's his motorcycle. You see it right down here. And Brandon is underneath that car. It happened in a split second. Well, there was a woman in the footage who gets down on the ground. She looks into the car. She sees his body there. It looks lifeless to her. And she said, he's gone. But then she looks again, and she says, he's breathing. And she starts to summon people, and others start to gather around. They start to try to lift this car. And they rock it just a bit, and they can't get it lifted up enough. And so they gather other people around, all good Samaritans. They don't know Brandon. They don't know even this driver. But it doesn't matter. And they gather around and they lift the car up sufficiently enough that that man with the vest on pulls Brandon out from underneath this car just about the time that the car explodes into flames. This is happening for our inactive members on a regular basis. Not that they're in an accident, but they're in that perfect storm of anxiety-provoking events. And they get pinned under a car. Sometimes it's their own doing. Sometimes it's just a freak accident. And it might be tempting to say to Brandon, Brandon, you know, if you had been wearing your helmet, you wouldn't have been as hurt. Brandon, if you'd looked both ways, Brandon, if you hadn't been on a joyride this day, if you had been, and on and on, they could have lectured him. But did that matter in that moment? No. There need to be a good Samaritan. In fact, lots of good Samaritans to help lift and get him to safety. This is a metaphor for reconnecting ministry. A metaphor for what we're about. We're good Samaritans helping to make the journey of life good for them and for us. A couple other things change the culture, friends. Plan ways to carry out reconnecting ministries immediately. Write your values. Here's an example. Innovative attenders are not a problem, they're a pleasure. Remember our mindset's important, isn't it? Because if we're saying all the right words, but in our mind we're going, eh, they're a problem. Folks will read that 93% and they'll know but that's what we're thinking. So write your values. What are the values you have for this ministry? Name your goals. Here's one idea. We will continually provide inspiring training to our members on reconnecting ministry. Well, that's a value that's ongoing. will never end, right? Name your goals. Three or four goals, you can identify those. Move through them. They don't encourage you to do what they call measurable objectives. These are real specifics. As the team that we've just identified, I think you ought to say, over the next 12 months, we will provide six different events, two on Sabbath mornings, two on Wednesday evenings, two online. Get real specific. So-and-so will be involved. We'll have so much money involved. We'll meet in this room. Get real specific about what you do. If you really generalize Reconnecting ministry won't happen. But if you think about what do we value, what are our goals, how do we get specifically involved in moving into this ministry, it helps to, for the sustainability of it. That's a full page. Should I leave it up for just a second? This is really some substance of strategic planning, isn't it? A number of you recognize that from a workplace application. But we've got to use it more in the church. Have clear plans, implement them, adjust them, evaluate them. At a minimum, we're encouraging, and you, you find this in this resource with further explanation, right? But at a minimum, what we're asking from North America is initiate a prayer focus on a reconnected ministry. Hmm? It's in your 
Spiral bound book. Yep. Okay, right at the beginning. It has that picture right at the front, right? There it is. Gather and distribute reconnecting ministry information. You know, if we'd mail something to you, we do use the snail mail. Um, but if we email something, who's it go to if you don't have a reconnecting leader and team? Plan two or three initiatives per year. Coordinate with other ministries of the church. Remember the greeting ideas? It's good to work with the leader of the greeting ministry. Don't just waltz in and say, oh, you lucky people, I went to a training event and I have some good greeter tips for you. And the greeter leader is going to say, stay away from my group. It could be, in some churches, it works under the umbrella of personal ministries. Other people, it's part of what the elders do. And for some congregations, it's really a separate ministry, but collaborative with, meets at the board level with other leaders of the church. Your church needs to decide. Advocate, become educated, Ask for a budget or do some fundraising. If you ask your church business um, leaders, uh, finance committee, or the treasurer, and they go, yeah, we don't have any money for this. Then there are people who probably have a heart for it, would like to give to it and designated funds for the church. And if you do that, then you'll have some funding. If you don't have funding for this, it won't get off the ground. You need a clear leader, you need a budget, and then you need some plans. Look to that resource for further explanation. Talk about reconnecting ministries everywhere, at every meeting, in every communication piece that you have, your newsletters, any other ways that you communicate. Engage the artist in, in helping you with some symbolism that helps to depict this is what reconnecting ministry is all about. On the campus of La Sierra University, is a sculpture that's put together called The Welcoming Father. It shows the father running out of the doorway. His coat is flying behind him, and he's going toward his son that's there on his knees. Older brother, of course, in the background, arms crossed, very scowling. Beautiful symbolism. In your church, whatever you name your reconnecting ministry, get somebody to put something together, sculpt something, draw something. Whatever you can do, engage your artists, but use symbolism to communicate over and over again. Because remember, communication takes at least seven times for it to really sink in with people. Sometimes verbally, sometimes handed to, sometimes a trusted friend tells you about it. Other ways that you find out, it takes repetition. Make sure your wording adds value. Your wording adds value. Don't shame people. Don't try to kind of twist their arm into something. Really make sure it adds value to their lives and the lives of the leaders in the church. And reduce the cringe factor. We're going to go out and we're going to care. We're, we're going to reach out to the backsliders. Ooh. Or the black sheep, I've heard. Inappropriate term on several levels. Uh, and other terms as you go, ooh. That's not good. So think about the words we use and the way we communicate, what happens. I don't know, is this helpful in kind of embedding the idea and the concept of the church? Advocate. What we focus on expands. Remember that? As one of my friends says, check your stinking thinking. <laughs> if we perceive our inactive members are a problem, Guess what? They are. What we focus on then expands. They're trouble around here or they're great. Speak up in meetings, in planning sessions. We've got to advocate. We've got to monitor early encounters at church. We've got to up, uh, readily apologize to returning members when, when awful things take place. And we need to intervene 
with the offending members. We've got to say something. The, uh, the woman who said, well, 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 our little black sheep is home. Remember her? How could you forget her, right? A church could not bring themselves to ask her to do something that was in a private office away from people. She obviously didn't have people skills. They really needed her to do something that was task structured and, and, and more with paperwork. They couldn't bring themselves to ask her to not be a greeter. But what they did was they had someone else who's a greeter shadow her everywhere she went while she was a greeter. Would intervene, would apologize, who would, who would help try to save the day if something like that happened. And it happened less because this woman now knows, all right, I've got somebody monitoring what I'm doing. <laughs> That's what the church had to decide to do. Intervene. It's important when we do these kinds of ministries that we periodically assess them. No, that says access, doesn't it? Those should be two S's. Assess periodically what you're pleased and troubled about. Sorry for that typo. Try things, evaluate them, then go again. Remember they're not always perfect when they start. And maybe even along the way because things change. Be willing to fail enough to succeed. Be willing to fail enough to succeed. You won't totally succeed. Manage the tension. Meaning not always can you change people. Not always can you change the environment of your church. Not always can you get things to be just the way you want with your pastor or your board. Manage that tension, but do all you can to help make the success of this happen. And you're assessing on a regular basis. Be voluntarily accountable and don't make active members inactive members. Just a recap of where we were earlier today. And celebrate the milestones. Celebrate these milestones. Infuse joy into the journey of what takes place. Make this fun. Take any accomplishment that you've had, tie it to the vision of the reconnecting ministry, recognize it for what's happened. Because when you do that, it gives you the opportunity to then say, and here's where we're going next. So you celebrate. Isn't God good? Look at what's taken place here. Thank you for your hard work and your involvement. So-and-so's back. So these initiatives seem to have gone well. Greater percentage of people are involved in this ministry. Celebrate those things. Be happy about them. It's a, in a, a wonderful way to empower people and re-articulate the vision from time to time and keeps it sustained and growing. And tell people stories. They inspire us. I know they inspire me, don't you? Well, I don't know if this uh, is applicable to your situation, but I hope that there's some takeaways for you here. There is no magic to this other than the work of the Spirit. And we count on that, right? But it means we just pay attention. We do all we can to respond to the grace that we've been given. I was in a group one time and I asked, so how's your list coming? List of names of people, right? Woman said, I have 101 names at this moment. Yeah. Now, don't get discouraged. If you have three or five or ten, that's more normal. But she knew a lot of people. And she was paying attention. Her awareness was greater than many of us. I think now that you've spent several hours together, and we'll have just a few more hours tomorrow morning together, 
your awareness has been raised, hasn't it? You're paying attention. You're going to see the way that people leave. You're going to say, ah, I think something's happening there. What can I do? You're going to draw close. We have a couple of minutes. Any questions? Yeah, and it's online. You could you could uh, view it and listen to it there. It's listed there in the back, yeah, as well as at Advent Source Webinars Greeting. Mm -hmm. So there are a few hints there. Please. Contact info. Oh, you didn't. How about, how about, I'm sorry, I have paper cards. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's not all electronic. He can find it on the web, though. He, he can find it on the web, of course. Yeah, that's right. If you need a card, I've got them. All right, all right. So there it is. What else, friends? Some of you are looking at me like, you know, the mind can only absorb, but the sea can endure, and I've been sitting here a long time. How do you get started? There you go. That's a good answer. The rest of you want to answer? Where would you start? Start talking to people. Exactly. Look online, right? If you have those kind of, of, of contacts, you're going to start seeing little, little hints here and there. Yes. Exactly. I think another hint I'd have for you is talk to your pastor. And if you've got agreement there that this is a ministry you want to do in the church, then start meeting with the church clerk and say, so do we have a list of people we know that still have membership here and we just haven't seen them in a while? Start developing a list that way. There's another idea. Did you have another idea or another question? Yes. Nicely said. Good. But anyhow, but now, um, uh, the last few months, I decided, well, now let's go to uh, just some of our members that have either been ill, have uh, had death mm -hmm. in the family, mm -hmm. or some other reason. Mm -hmm. So then I compiled a list of those, mm -hmm. and I did the same thing. So I, we have people, you know, including we, we yeah. got names. Yes. And Terrific. And uh, so now it's going to dovetail into yeah. having that baloney turn up. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, so now we're on the steering committee, but we're going to be doing some of the same type of things. But that's why we felt like we could benefit from some of your uh, class. Nice. So nice. These things, the things I think, oh, yeah, that's we could do it. But, but yeah. we need a lot of help here. Right? Well, thanks for what you're doing. Don't you like what you hear? There's some momentum there, following up on it. Chronic illness, you, you had a good point there. People who are chronically ill, not only the individual, but the family, the caregivers, they have gotten into the habit of caring for somebody. They're away from the church because of it. Either when the person passes away or they get better and they're ready to come back to church, it's easy to go, well, we've not been in the habit for a while. Or providing them care really helps them to not want to slip away, but feel like they're still engaged in the church. One of the persons that I, I'm in contact with, and she's been coming, she came to our last evangelical series. She has not joined, but uh, I continue on working with her. She's a good friend. And, 
Yes. Good. Good. And um, and so I, you know, so then she got in contact with the pastor. He's already been uh-huh. there. And uh, I just, so I'm calling her and I'm saying, you know, um, we we just can't let this go without something being done. She said, I I just appreciate everything. She said, I consider mm-hmm. you and some of the other mm-hmm. my church family. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. That's what it's about, friends. It's just when you get that opportunity, God given, do all you can. And you with a few people and the next person with a few people and pretty soon the the whole collection of effort produces a result that you just never know where God will bring this about to a wonderful conclusion.